You can turn on the Arts in Video for free, link in the description. For this party follow system, we will first create a follower scene that will represent each of the party members. Create a new scene with the Node 2D as the core. Right click, rename, rename it to follower, then go to scene, scene save as, and save it. Add a sprite 2D node as a child. Set the texture filter to nearest as we are using pixel art. As for the texture, you don't necessarily need to set it now, as it will be set in the script. This is so we can assign a different texture per party member while still using the same scene. However, to set up the animation, we will require a texture for now. Set the texture to the player sprite that you can get for free, link in the description. Set the H frames and the V frames to 2. Add an animation player node to the scene. For animations, make sure that each character there can be a party member has their own individual sprite sheets with the same animations in the same locations. This way, the animation player can animate every possible character as it will just refer to the sprite 2D's frame value and therefore doesn't require you to create a unique animation player for each individual character. Go to animation and hit new. Name it 1.0 idle. For this animation system, we'll be using a number that represents the vertical look direction followed by the animation that we intend to do. Set the total animation time to 0.1. Make sure that the player head is at zero then select the sprite 2d node and hit the keyframe button next to frame at zero then press create then go to animation and select duplicate name it 1.0 run set the total time to 0.2 you can then use control or command plus the scroll wheel to zoom into the animation player set the playhead position to 0.1 then select the first keyframe value press control or command plus d to duplicate the keyframe then select the first keyframe again and change its value to one we do this so that transitioning from the idle to the running state doesn't have any slight 0.1 second pause between as we are immediately changing from the idle frame of 0 to the run frame of 1. Go to animation, select duplicate, name it negative 1.0 run, select the first keyframe, change its value to 3, then select the second keyframe and change its value to 2, then go to the animation, select 1.0 idle, hit animation, duplicate, name it negative 1.0 idle, select the keyframe and set its value to 2. Finally, select the follower node 2D and add a script. Inside, we will define 8 variables. Acceleration and friction are used for smoothing the movement. We will set these to the player script's own acceleration and friction to ensure that the player and the party members move at the same speed and at the same acceleration and friction. Additionally, we use colon followed by float to define what this variable should equal. This gives a slight increase in performance as Godot won't need to try and guess what each variable is meant to equal. And by doing this, we make sure that we don't accidentally set this variable to a different type, which is why we call this a type hint. We then have two onReady variables. An onReady variable is a variable that sets its value during the ready phase of the script, which is the same time when the ready function should activate. These two variables will simply hold a reference to the sprite and animation player nodes, which we can use this instead of writing the path to these nodes multiple times in the script. This ensures that if we change the name of these nodes or move them around in the scene tree. We don't have to rewrite their paths multiple times as we can just update the tree here. For the final four variables, player moving is what we will use to know if we should switch between acceleration or friction. As this node is going to go towards a target position that the player provides, it's impossible to interpret whether we will receive a new target position update. So this helps with that and therefore allows for the node to move and stop at relatively the same speed and time as the player node. Target pause is what this node is moving towards. This will be set by the player as the player moves around to ensure that each party member remains at a set amount of distance from one another. Look Dir is for the animation, as it will inform us whether we are looking up, down, or left or right. Last look dir y is the last y value that the look dir provided. For look dir dot y became zero. We require this variable as our animation names use a 1.0 or negative 1.0, which is in reference to the look dir dot y value. But passing 0.0, .0 would create an error, which is why we must keep track of the last known look dir y. We will first create a custom function called setup. This includes a built-in variable called sprite texture, which is a string. Additionally, we add a minus greater than symbol pointed towards void. This is a function type int similar to the type hints for variables. However, this just means that the function won't return any value as we don't intend to set any value to this function. I will mention more about this later in the player script when we do return something from a function. First, we check while not sprite, meaning that the sprite is null or not equal to any value. Then we await get tree.physics frame. While will run the code inside and stop any code from outside running until the while loop is complete. This code simply ensures that we don't run the next line of code until the sprite is set. We do this as the player will call and run this function immediately when we are spawning this node in, which could cause an error as the sprite node may not be loaded into the scene when this code is called and we don't use a ready function as we want the player to pass the sprite texture for this party member. Additionally, a wait will stop any code until it's received its signal to continue and the signal is physics frame. Get tree will grab the core of the scene and physics frame is one frame in physics time which is the same as a frame in a physics process function. Another type of frame is the process frame which is the same as the process function. Once we know that the sprite is equal to our sprite node, we then set the sprite texture to the built-in sprite texture variable. We use load as the string we receive will be the file path to the texture image. Inside the built-in physics process function. For the movement of the follower code, we will first define old pods to store the previous position before moving. This will later be used for the animation system to know whether or not we are moving or idle. Then for movement, we will set global position to a lerp, which a lerp moves the first value towards the second at a rate of the third, which is also known as the weight. For pause lerp weight, we make it equal to acceleration if the player is moving, else friction. This is important as my player has the same lerp system for their movement, although instead of global position, it's velocity, and instead of target pause, is a max speed variable. This is why the player moving variable is so important, so we'll ensure both the 
follower and the player accelerate and decelerate at the same time and speed. We make this negative as we want to move towards the target position, not away from it. Then we multiply by delta to ensure it's frame rate independent, as delta is the amount of real world time since the previous frame. EXP is an exponential function that returns a mathematical constant of E to the power of whatever is inside the brackets. This tells us the exact fraction of what we should apply this frame to move towards target position. And finally, we do 1.0 minus the exponential function to turn what remains into what we actually apply this frame because we need the amount to apply, not the amount that remains. As for animation, we will first check if lookdir.y, meaning that it is not equal to zero. Then we will set the last lookdir.y to it. Then we check the distance from the global position to the old position variable. If it is more than 0.1, we will play the run animation, else we will idle. If we are running, then we check if lookdir.x is not equal to zero. If so, we flip the sprite horizontally based on if we are looking left or right. As for running the animation in our animation player, to make the code cleaner, we will create a custom function called play animation, which will hold a built-in variable called animation name. Inside, we will check if the animation player node has been loaded in. If not, then we simply call return. Return will skip all the code below, and we use an if statement instead of a while loop because we are calling this function constantly every physics frame, whereas setup will only be called once. If the animation player node has loaded in, then we check if the animation player has the animation that we are trying to call. This check is to avoid any potential spelling related errors. So if your animations aren't running, then it most likely means that your animation name that you are passing is spelled incorrectly compared to the animation names you defined earlier when setting up the animation player node. Then we play the animation passing the animation name variable. Now inside the built-in physics process function, we can call the play animation function using str to combine the last look y value and the text of the animation name into a result that is a string value. Now to have the player update and spawn in the follower scene, go to your player script. We will first define three variables. Followers is an array that will hold the follower scene nodes that we add to the scene. This array type in also has a node 2D, which means that this array can only hold node 2D inherited node or nodes that have a blue icon. Distance spacing is the amount of pixels we want between each follower node. Trail points is an array that will store the player's position as they move. This will be provided to the follower nodes as their target position. We will then define a constant called follower scene preload. A constant is the same as a variable, except you can't change its value during runtime when the game is playing. This is then equal to a preload of the follower scene. To get the path to the follower scene, find the follower scene in the bottom left file system, then press right click and select copy path. You can now use control or command plus V to paste it into your code. A preload is the same as using load. However, with preload, the string path to the scene is constant and can't be changed during runtime. Similar to the difference between a constant and a variable, with preload being like a constant and load being like a variable, both preload and load will provide a reference to the scene file where the string path is, which we can later use to add the follower node to the scene. We will then create a custom function for the party member follow logic. We will also call this in the physics process function after we have completed our movement. Inside the follower logic function, we will first add points to the trail points array. We do this if either the array is completely empty, as we need some sort of position to move the party members to, or if the first point in the array is more than one pixel away from the player's global position, meaning that the player has moved enough that we should update the array. Then we grab the trail points array and call push front, passing the player's global position. Push front will add the global position to the array at the first spot, which in an array is zero. Next, we will remove any old positions within the array. That way, the array doesn't infinitely grow bigger and drop the FPS. We define a variable to hold the max trail length, which is equal to the amount of followers that there are, multiplied by the distance spacing. We get the total followers as we need to ensure that there are enough trail points for each follower to move towards, and we multiply by distance spacing as the player is constantly putting their global position inside the array. But to apply distance spacing, we will have the followers grab the positions in the array that are away from each other based on the distance spacing. We will then use a while loop to ensure that the old trail points are removed before continuing the code. Inside, we will check if trail points has more positions stored than allowed by the max trail length. If so, then we use pop back, which removes the last element or value in an array. Now to update the target position of the follower scene, we will use a for loop to iterate through each follower in the follower array. Followers array stores a reference to each follower, and using a for loop makes the i variable that we made up for the loop equal to the value that we are up to as we search through the follower array. Additionally, because we are grabbing the size of the follower array, not just the follower array on its own, due to needing to know the order of the follower nodes, as if, for example, there are two followers added, then i will equal to zero, go through all the code in the loop, then i will equal one, go through all the code in the loop, and then complete for the two followers. There are more, then it will continue. For the path position, we will be creating a custom function called get point along trail with a built-in variable for distance. Like mentioned before with function type ins, this function will return a vector two. That's because the purpose of this function is to search through the trail points array and find the correct points that are a distance spacing away from each other. Then have this function return that vector two, meaning that we can set our path pos variable to this function later. Inside the get points along trail function, we'll first define a variable for the total amount of distance that we have traveled. This will be used to keep track of the distance between each pair of two points in the trail point array. That way, if we reach a total that is equal to the desired distance, then we can just pass the position at that point. Then we use a for loop to iterate through the trail points array size, and we do negative one to avoid the very last element in the array, as we will be checking the i and the i plus one. And if we were to allow i to equal the last value, then i plus one would error as there wouldn't be enough values to grab, as it would be trying to grab a value that doesn't exist. Then we define two variables for two points in the array. This is where i plus one comes into play. Point a is the start of the current segment that we 
we're checking, and point B is the end of it. We then define segment length to store the length of the distance between the two points. This will tell us whether the requested distance falls between these two points. Then we check if the total plus the segment length is more than or equal to distance, meaning that the distance we are looking for lies within this segment. We then create a variable called t, which will tell us how far along the segment do we need to travel to get the exact distance. We do distance minus total to know how far into the segment that we are. For example, if we had three points with the distance between point A and B being 10 units and the distance between point B and C being 15 units, the requested distance from the distance variable is equal to 12 units. Then the total will be 10 as 12 isn't in the segment from A to B. So therefore, we would say that we are two units into the B to C segment. We then divide this by segment length to convert the value to a fraction that ranges from 0 to 1, which from our example would be the percentage of progress from point B to point C. Return makes this function equal to the value being returned. And using lerp, we can grab the position between point A and point B based on how close T is equal to 0 or 1. If T is equal to 0, then we get point A exactly. If T is equal to 1, then we get point B exactly. And if T is equal to a value that falls between 0 and 1, then we get whatever position lies between those two points based on T. Return will also skip the code below and finish the for loop early. However, if the current segment that we are checking does not have the desired distance, then we will add the segment length to the total. This way we can keep track of the amount of distance that we have covered before continuing to the next segment. Finally, because this is a function that returns something, no matter what, it must return something. This line will only run if we didn't manage to find a suitable position within the trail points array, as the requested distance is further than what is available within the array. So we will just return the last value inside the trail points array, which can be grabbed by calling the back function. Now, back in the follower logic function, we can set the path pos variable to the function get points along trail. As for the distance that we want, we provide distance spacing multiplied by the follower that we are up to. This ensures that there is the same distance spacing between each follower. Additionally, we do i plus 1 as the for loop will start at 0, and multiplying by 0 just returns 0. So we must add 1. Then we can grab the follower array at the position of i and set player moving based on if round velocity, which will return true if velocity when rounded is not equal to 0, 0, else it will return false. Then we pass the path pos to the target pos of the follower. As for the look direction of the follower, we do the follower's global position minus the path pos to get the direction pointing from the path pos to the follower. Then we use normalize to convert this into a vector 2, where x and y can only be a value that ranges from negative 1 to 1. Then we round this as the look dir can't have any decimals, considering that the animation names are 1.0 and negative 1.0, meaning that they don't take into account decimals like 0.1 or 0.9. And finally, we multiply this by negative 1 as we want the look direction from the follower's global position towards the path pos or target pos, not the other way around. Now to add followers to the scene and set them up properly, we will create a custom function called spawn follower, which will have a built-in variable called sprite texture. First, we define a variable that will store the new copy of the follower scene. This can be done by using instantiate on the follower scene preload. We then set the acceleration and friction to the player's acceleration and friction. If you want the followers to have a different value, then you can do that here, or you can instead remove this code and set it directly within the follower script. For setting the position of the new follower, we first check if trail points is empty and has no positions inside. If so, then we will add the player's global position. Then we set the global position to the get points along trail function, passing the distance spacing, multiplied by the number of followers plus one. We add one to the total amount of followers in the case that there are zero, as zero multiplied by distance spacing would be zero. Additionally, we make sure to append the player's global position if there are no positions within the trail points array. This is because in the case we don't find a good segment, then we just return the last value of the trail points. And if there are no values within the trail points array, then we would receive an error and the game would crash. Finally, we add the new follower to the scene. We first grab the parent of the player node, which is hopefully the topmost node in your level. We do this instead of adding the follower as a child of the player directly. To avoid the player offsetting the follower position when the player moves, as we want the followers to have their own independent position moving. Then we grab the function add child. Then we use call deferred on it and pass the new follower scene. We add call deferred to ensure that the function add child is ran at the end of the current frame. This will avoid potential issues that could arise due to certain dependencies within your code. Then we grab the new follower scene and call it setup function that we created earlier, passing the built-in sprite texture from the spawn function. This way, each follower can look unique from one another with a different texture while still using the same exact scene. Additionally, we make sure that this line runs after the add child line as we require the node to be added to the scene before we can call the setup function. With call deferred, this ensures that at the end of the current frame, add child runs, then setup runs immediately after. Finally, we add the new follower scene to the followers array. Now an example of using the spawn follower function can include inside of the player script, following the spawn function, then passing the texture that you want the follower to look like. Keep in mind to get the path to the texture, simply find it in the file browser in the bottom left, right click and press copy path. Now you can paste that path with control or command plus V. Additionally, because the spawn follower is like any other function, you can call it from other scripts within the same scene as the player node by first finding and grabbing the player node, then calling the spawn follower function and passing the texture that you want the follower to look like. Now you have an RPG party follow system that you can add to any of your top down 2D games. And don't forget, you can check out the project files, link in the description.